It's great to see you all. Um, I might say in relation to what Robin just said, actually, he's the real one who connected us to Sarah Gilbert because uh, it was his idea. He had that inspiration. It was a very good inspiration because she was very open, very happy to take in that role. What I'd like to talk to, about today is um, in relation to the fact that it's UN Human Rights Day today, um, I felt to talk about the role of a free media in protecting religious freedom worldwide. And um, <clears throat> I want to start by just reminding you, I'm sure all of you are aware, very well aware of these things, but there are many, many uh, very, very uh, distressing religious freedom situations around the world. Um, just a week or 10 days ago, whenever it was, Bishop Mount Stephen from the um, Church of England um, reported on the plight of minority Christians worldwide. There are so many places where Christians are actually in a, quite a small minority and they get persecuted like anyone else. But of course, it's no, by no means limited to Christians because in Pakistan, the Ahmadis have had a very, very hard time since just the early 1950s. Um, they've uh, irregularly people, their members have been killed and uh, very, very badly treated. The Rohingyas in Burma, in, in what is now Myanmar, uh, have had an incredibly difficult time. They've basically had to migrate to Pakistan and with all the insecurities and deficiencies that that brings into their lives. Uh, and of course, we all know about the Uyghurs suffering uh, from genocide uh, in China, being imprisoned in large indoctrination camps and so on, which the Chinese deny. But anyway, I think it's recognized as fact by everybody else. Uh, the point about all of these four things is we know about them, and we have a, quite a clear picture of them because the media, in relation to these, maybe they haven't given them as much publicity as they should. There are all kinds of things like that one can say. But on the whole, we're pretty well informed and we pretty well much know what's going on. Uh, and in that sense, we can applaud the media and say the media have done a, a reasonably good job in making clear. And of course, there are many other uh, examples I could have cited, pages and pages of them, but I just chose these as the, probably the best known ones um, of all. And um, so I, what I chose to talk about, and it's a little bit close to home for UPF and for Family Federation is, because it relates to what's been happening with our own movement in Japan, um, where religious freedom is under very severe threat. Japan is a uh, why this is serious is because Japan is the world's third largest economy. Japan aspires to uh, very uh, elevated status in the world because it's trying to espouse you know, values of uh, Western democracy and so on, human rights. Uh, and it even has been helping to promulgate uh, treaties around the world for the uh, advancement of religious freedom in all countries because probably 70 or more percent of countries in the world have a problem with religious freedom. And what well, maybe in a sense all do, I think this country does in some ways too, so we, nobody is blameless. But I think the big point is that Japan in that position, promulgating you, free, religious freedom around the world, you would think, and most people would think, especially after the difficult history of, the, of Japan in the 1940s particularly, that Japan was now uh, heading towards paragon status in terms of human rights um, observance and so on. But actually, that's not the case. And we are the ones who've found this out to our, our cost. Uh, probably some of you will have read in the, the, I know The Guardian has carried pieces on this, The Times, The Independent. Um, I think The Telegraph had one piece as well. Various UK newspapers have covered it, but and also the BBC, two Sundays ago, the Sunday before last, they had the Sunday morning religious affairs program. They had a piece on it as well. And uh, two nights ago, I was watching BBC World News. I can't remember why, but anyway, um, they uh, had a piece interviewing a British professor in a Japanese university talking about this case. And not one of them remotely, remotely touched on the core of the matter, the heart of the matter, the essential truth that you need to understand in order to uh, is assess the situation. So I want to just briefly recap. Um, 
On July the 8th, I'm sure all of you are aware that tragically Shinzo Abe, the former Prime Minister of Japan, was assassinated by somebody called Tetsuya Yamagami while he was out campaigning in the streets and he was shot. It really shocked Japan and I think shocked the world. And um, he was, uh, Mr. Abe was actually very closely linked to UPF. He had appeared on a couple of things publicly, but behind the scenes he was really a very, very strong supporter. And we were very proud of our association with him and he was a very dear friend and colleague. Uh, this was, of course, after he was prime minister. And um, so he, he was partly drawn by the fact that his grandfather, uh, Nobusuke Kishi, who was prime minister from 1957 to 60 in Japan, uh, collaborated very closely with our movement to set up something called the International Federation for Victory over Communism. Because, as I'll explain later, Japan was in a very parlous state at that time in the late 60s, early 70s. Communism was gaining a hold in many countries, including Japan itself. And um, anyway, Mr. Kishi, as then a former prime minister, was very anxious to do something about it. So uh, anyway, um, this was the root of his connection to us. And then actually his son, uh, Shintaro Abe, became the foreign minister of Japan, uncle of Shinzo Abe. And there's a strong sort of family, also close to, to UPF's uh, predecessors. So the assassin's mother uh, was a member of the Family Federation, the Unification Church, otherwise known. And she made a large donation to, um, from her family business to Family Federation. And um, he claimed that was the reason why he assassinated Shinzo Abe. You can see it's a rather complicated story, but um, he resented our, our founder, uh, the surviving founder, Mother Moon, because of that. And he thought that killing Abe was somehow uh, going to assuage his difficult feelings. So the leftist media in Japan immediately started to spread a totally false narrative which was that the Family Federation or UP, uh, Unification Church was responsible for the killing of Shinzo Abe. And uh, this is a picture of him actually being arrested in uh, Nara City when he, after the assassination. He's holding a, a homemade gun there. And um, <coughs> the important thing is what the media have failed to mention. Some of the things that they mentioned are true, but it's the things they haven't mentioned that help you to actually understand the things that are true that they should have mentioned more than anything else. First of all, concerning the, the person himself, Yamagami came from a, a really troubled family, really sad family, long before they had anything to do with the church. Uh, his mother, his uh, father committed suicide and also brother committed suicide, and I believe he, even, he himself at one point tried to commit suicide. And uh, so they were a very troubled family, and anyone would think that that was a, could be a major factor in him doing such a, a terrible deed. But the media didn't, for the most part, didn't even mention it. Secondly, uh, Family Federation Japan, many years ago, 2009, gave back half the donation that the mother had given because they felt they hadn't been sensitive enough to the family's financial situation. And therefore, uh, you know, they should uh, give back half of what they had given, and they did. Um, Yamagami himself was never a Family Federation member. Many newspapers said he was. Le Monde just published an article saying he was a former member of Family Federation. He wasn't. Um, also, he had connections to the Japanese Communist Party, which I think you'll find significant in the light of what I'm going to tell you uh, later. So this provoked a massive wave, unbelievable wave of negative publicity across Japan. Altogether, 900, 900 different TV and radio programs featuring the false narrative, not giving the true narrative, uh, were carried. Seven, or more than 7,000 media articles were published in, uh, of course, online, but in local and national newspapers. And, um, of course, this caused a great stirring of hatred and contempt for the Family Federation and, to some extent, for the affiliated organizations like like UPF. So what were the repercussions from the false narrative? I can just give you briefly a very few of them, there are many, many, but um, first of all, the Japanese government was incited to remove 
the religious corporation status of the uh, church, of the family federation, uh, which is equivalent to charitable status here in, in the UK. In other words, no tax exemption and no recognition by a, the government or society or whatever. Um, then um, that, that is in process. It's been started, but of course it hasn't been done yet, and we hope it won't be done because there's lots to come out before it happens. Secondly, um, they're trying to get, uh, give people the right. This is for all religions. I mean, imagine this. They're trying to give every um, person who's family member or, or they themselves have given money to a religious organization to, they're trying to give them the right to claim back that money even 10, 15, 20 years later if they decide that actually they shouldn't have given it for whatever reason. You can imagine, this is of course very cunning because it means that if you give a certain amount of money to the Catholic Church in Japan, you know you can always get it back and the Catholic Church knows they can't really spend it because you may ask for it back after five or 10 years. So this is an absurd violation of religious freedom. If somebody genuinely, sincerely from their heart gives what they feel to give, if they change their minds later, then they can't blame the organization for having spent the money on some philanthropic purpose, which is what basically Family Federation does. And um, other things, uh, carrying out a major investigation of all the files and all the paperwork at the uh, headquarters in Japan. They, just to emphasize the pettiness of it, 20 years ago, one of our, uh, the directors of our Women's Federation, that's the sort of women's equivalent of UPF in a sense, um, she set up a, um, a school in Africa for five or 600 pupils in Mozambique, very, very well regarded locally, did a lot for the local population. Japanese ambassador comes there and gives her an award thanking her for all she's done for Japan, not only for Mozambique, because you can imagine educating five or 600 people for 20 years is quite a commitment, it takes a lot of investment of all kinds. And um, uh, this recently was revoked purely on the basis of this false narrative. So, you know, they're trying to strip Family Federation and its affiliated organizations like Women's Federation of all credibility of all credit or honor that they've gained through the good works that they have done. And there's many more examples like that. I'm just giving you one. Uh, trying to stop, you know, like m most religious organizations in Japan uh, sell, quote unquote, products, sacred objects for a high price. And they don't pretend that that's the commercial value if it was just a secular item. But anyway, um, they're trying to stop that by all religious groups in Japan, which is a major, major change. They're denying UPF the right of access to politicians. Their um, local government is withdrawing cooperation and so on and so forth. So what the media has failed to report is that what the true narrative is, which first of all um, has nothing to do, had nothing to do with the assassination. Um, other than what the claim is of the, of the uh, assassin. And um, they're, they're uh, making it out as if the whole thing was a spontaneous welling up of feeling on the part of the Japanese people. But that is totally false, as, as you'll see from this. Uh, so far from being spontaneous, um, public opinion uh, against UPF and its affiliates is a result of a very carefully developed and coordinated plan on the part of leftist elements in Japanese society. I need to explain that briefly. The key people behind that are the Japanese Communist Party, the Socialist Party of Japan, various leftist lawyers groups, various national and local media, and the key media contributor is the Asahi Shinbun, the biggest paper in Japan with a five to six million circulation every day. And um, anyway, very briefly, because uh, I don't really have enough time to explain all of this, but um, IFVOC was an organization set up with uh, Mr. Kishi, the former prime minister, in the late, uh, in the middle uh, 70s. And the purpose of it was to educate people about the fallacies and the dangers of communism. And the two key ones are, very, very fundamentally, communism denies the existence of God and wants to try to stop all other people from experiencing God because they 
denoted as the opiate of the masses and it's not real and you should get real and live without God. And of course, the religions of the world feel rather differently. And they're trying to perpetrate that. And they're also, um, there, were, there were lots of problems with communism at that time in the 60s and 70s. I won't go into them. But um, IFVOC developed very well, educated millions and millions of Japanese people. And as a result, the growth of the Communist Party and of communism in Japan was very, very much limited. And um, Shinzo Abe and his family and many others are very, very grateful for that. And the main point of education is communism denies religion, the value of religion, denies the existence of God, and would like to see the elimination of all religion. That is the manifesto of the communists. So this, they're using us as an excuse. And um, on November, in November uh, just past, they revealed their hand, which was surprising because it was very good for them not to be seen to be conspiring, but they revealed it in public interviews. The Shinzo, uh, sorry, uh, Kazuo Shi, the chairman of the Japan Communist Party, said, from the standpoint of the Communist Party, it is, this is the last war against the Unification Church. And one of his other colleagues um, wrote in the, in the Sunday Mainichi Shimbun, he wrote that the end the end of the final war with the old, this, what will happen now, next? The end of the final war with the old Unification Church. So the media in Japan and Europe has kept completely silent about this, which is very, very strange, because you'd think people would like to know what's behind this. And um, anyway, the true narrative is now just beginning to gain traction. Uh, Newt Gingrich, the kind of father figure of the Republican Party in America, has now spoken out very strongly. There are many leaders in North America, I can't name them because they've asked for, that, for us not to name them for the time being, who are ready to come out. They've, one of them has said, I'll fly to Japan tomorrow and I'll confront Kishida for you. We said, actually, you know, we, we need to handle it slightly differently, but that's the kind of sentiment that this is arousing because the, the value of UPF in particular is so greatly felt in, in North America. Anyway, um, uh, another lady, Masumi Fukuda, who's a leading, probably the leading Japanese freelance journalist, has now published an article in a magazine called Hanada, which the Prime Minister reads, Kishida reads, uh, saying this is all a false narrative, the whole thing is hocus pocus, you haven't looked at the reality, you know, forget about all the persecution of the Unification Church, watch out for the, for the um, advance of communism. Mm -hmm. And um, we put in submissions to the UN Human Rights Council, and we remain optimistic that we will eventually overcome all of these things. And why I'm explaining it to you is this. First of all, because I feel there's a very genuine point that the media has a huge responsibility, not just in this case, but in all cases, to uh, really report accurately about human rights abuses, to go into them rather than choose a juicy, easy story as the British media have done uh, and just uh, parrot that. They need to go into it, they need to find out the real truth behind it, and then they need to report that. Uh, but they tend not to, and that's a, a cause of many, many human rights violations, not just of uh, our church in Japan, but uh, many other religious situations. So I think that um, it's also been important for people in UPF, many of our ambassadors for peace have been asking, because they've read the articles, they've seen the, some programs on the BBC. Um, we can tell you a lot more, but I can't tell you more in 10 minutes. So uh, more and more is coming out. I think the, 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 the wheel is beginning to turn full circle. I think very soon it will become common knowledge. I think North America is getting ready to really pounce on Japan. The worry in America is a much bigger worry than just about Unification Church. They feel the communists are trying to change the balance of power in Asia through this by separating Japan from the United States. That's the view of, of the elder of the Republican Party, uh, Newt Gingrich. Anyway, I've gone on too long. Robin wanted to pull the trap door open, but uh, I put him off. If there are any quick questions, one, no, no time for questions, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, thank you.